Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Fritz Duras Memorial Lecture for 2023, which is entitled Bringing Physical Education into Conversation with Culture, Creativity and Technology. And I know you're all excitedly waiting to hear from our co-speakers of the Duras Lecture, which is Adam Goods, Dr. Baden Palethorpe, and being moderated by Adam Spencer. My name is Sue Watman. I am the National President of the Australian Council for Health, Physical Education and Recreation. And I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation as the traditional owners of these unceded lands and pay respect to their elders past and present. Atchbor would also like to extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, not only in the room with us tonight and watching online, but in the wider health and physical education and sport and recreation communities. I would like to thank the University of Melbourne and our branches of Atchbor, New South Wales and Atchbor, Victoria for helping us bring together this event for you this evening and also the lovely people here from the New South Wales Teachers Federation building. Now, Atchbor hosts the Fritz Duras Lecture in tandem with the University of Melbourne. Dr Duras was the founding president of the Australian Physical Education Association, which today is Atchbor. Dr. Duras also established the first Australian university course in physical education at the University of Melbourne. So I'd li now like to introduce Doc uh, Professor Jim Waterston, who will show, tell us a little bit more about Dr. Duras and his history. Thank you, Sue. Uh, we really appreciate the collaboration and the partnership between the two entities. So. It's wonderful to be putting this on again tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jim Waterston and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Education at the University of Melbourne. Uh, and I have the enviable task uh, tonight of introducing our presenters for this evening's Fritz Duras Remor uh, Memorial Lecture, organised collaboratively by the University of Melbourne and ATPA, as Sue um, said to you. I also want to acknowledge the ATPA New South Wales ACT and ATPA Victoria for their work in getting this um, together tonight. I would also like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and the tra traditional custodians of the land. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge the place of Indigenous knowledges, uh, indigenous knowledges in our academy. Uh, our memorial lecture tonight recognises Dr Fritz Duras, as Sue said, who is renowned as the father of physical education in Australia. He started the first course in physical education at the University of Melbourne in the late 1930s and since his passing in the 1960s, a lecture has been held regularly in his honour. Peter Duras, Fritz's son, who attends every lecture, sends his apologies this evening. He has asked that we note how much the family appreciates the dedication with which Atchba and the Faculty of Education celebrate his father's pivotal contribution to physical education in Australia. To quote Peter directly, with such outstanding speakers, the presentation promises to yet again be fitting recognition of Fritz's lasting legacy and the pioneering work of Margaret Williams Weir. As Peter mentions, this year we are also recognising an important graduate from the physical education course at the University of Melbourne, Dr um, Margaret Williams Weir. In the mid-1950s, Margaret became the first Indigenous Australian to graduate from a university course, the physical education course set up by Dr Duras, which earned her another title of trailblazer as she paved the way forward for other Indigenous students to follow. Following her graduation, she travelled the world teaching in various places, including England and Canada. Later, Margaret returned to Australia and joined the Commonwealth Teaching Service uh, in, and working in remote communities in the Northern Territory. Dr Williams Weir then went on to complete a PhD at the University of New England. Presenting the inaugural Yarramundi Lecture at the Western Sydney in 2014, Margaret said of her ed education, having graduated from the University of Melbourne, the world was there for me. My mother had always said, get an education and you can do anything, go anywhere, be anything. And she was, up, uh, and she was right because having that qualification opened up the world for me. Let's hope that we're still doing that for more young Indigenous people. In 2015, the University of Melbourne named an annual Vice-Chancellor's Fellowship in her honour, as well as the Faculty of Education's Postgraduate Student Lounge, named after Margaret. And in so many ways, her remarkable leg legacy lives on. We are very pleased that Margaret's great-great-nephew, Jordan, Jordan Williams, is here to this evening. Welcome, Jordan. Uh, to help us recognise Margaret's wonderful achievements. 
We very much appreciate you being here, Jordan, to share this important occasion with us. Another graduate of the physical education course from this period, Dr Elaine Murphy AM, has also joined us in, in person, travelling from Adelaide. Welcome, um, Elaine, and we thank you very much for your efforts to get here tonight. With these important connections of Dr Margaret Williams Weir and Dr Fritz Duras in mind, we sought speakers for this very special event who could do justice to their continuing relevance. It is therefore my great pleasure to take a few minutes, <laughs> a few minutes more than I already have, to introduce our two esteemed speakers, Adam Goods and Dr Baden uh, Palethorpe, and their friend and moderator this evening, uh, Adam Spencer. I will share an overview of their exceptional careers to give you a sense of the impact they have had on the community locally and beyond. Adam Goods is a proud um, Ardeneo Mathana of um, no, man known for his leadership. <laughs> Sorry about that, Adam. I practiced that all afternoon. I watched your video as well. Um, known for his leadership within the Indigenous community. In 2009, Adam set up the Goods O'Loughlin Foundation, the GO Foundation, with former Sydney Swans teammate Michael O'Loughlin. The GO Foundation's vision is to create a brighter future for Indigenous children through education. In 2014, Adam was named the Australian of the Year. This distinguished award recognised Adam's community work and advocacy in the fight against racism, empowering the next generation of Indigenous Australians. In 2016, Adam co-founded the Indigenous Defence and Infrastructure Consortium that provides education, skill training and employment opportunities for Indigenous Australians to support large defence and infrastructure projects. He is a dual AFL Brownlow medalist and a premiership player for the Sydney Swans a two-times Premiership player for the Sydney Swans, a four-time All-Australian, member of the Indigenous Team of the Century and a representative in the International Rules Series. Indeed, Adam holds an elite place in Australian Football League's history. He announced his retirement from the AFL in 2015, leaving the field as the Swans' games record holder on 372 and one of the most decorated players of all time. Thank you, Adam, for agreeing to present here tonight. Co-presenting with Adam is Dr Baden Palethorpe. Baden Palethorpe is a contemporary artist who works with emerging and experimental technologies. Since 2019, he has worked as a senior lecturer at the Australian National University School of Art and Design in Canberra, where he teaches across design, photography and media arts. His artistic practice examines the relationship between technology and power in domains such as sport, finance and the military. Baden has held over 100 exhibitions internationally since 2011, including world-renowned museums such as the Centre Pompidou in Paris. He has received numerous grants, awards and prizes, including five Australian Council for the Arts grants. In 2017, Baden was the first artist to work with biometric uh, player data at, from the AFL, leading in part to the collaborative Tracker Data Project, which revealed the cultural significance of Adam Good's AFL data. Baden and Adam have known each other for over 10 years and have worked collaboratively since 2017. Thank you, Baden, for presenting this evening. Joining them on stage as a moderator is Adam Spencer, who deserves no introduction, but we'll give you one anyway, Adam. Um, Adam has hosted award-winning breakfast radio shows in Australia's toughest markets and live current affairs TV. He has won, improvi uh, he has won improvised theatre competitions and once interviewed John Travolta in front of 75,000 people pretty good effort. With 25 years experience in television, radio and effort, uh, events, <laughs> Adam has interviewed Prime Ministers, Hollywood stars, Fortune 500 CEOs, Nobel Prize winning scientists and Australians of the Year. Uh, and he was also the first person in the world to interview our legendary Thai cave rescuers. We're grateful that Adam is here to share his experience and, exper and expertise in moderating this important conversation. Without any further ado, I will hand over to our presenters and moderator to discuss the 2023 Fritz Duras Memorial Lecture topic, bringing physical education into the conversation with culture, creativity and technology. Thanks, Adam. Thank you uh, very much, Jim. And ladies and gentlemen, we're very excited to be here. I thought we might start by talking a little bit about the wonderful Dr Margaret Williams Weir and then expand the conversation more broadly. Uh, we were lucky enough to have a phone call with, am I right, Baden, great-great-niece of the so, wonderful yes. Dr Margaret William Weir before? Yes, that Dr was Melissa Williams. Dr Melissa Williams, who filled us in a little bit on this woman, one of ten children who, when she was at Casino High, said to the, the principal, I'm going to study French and Latin if that's all right. And they said, well, there's never been a black child in French or Latin class. And she said, 
cool. I'm going to study French and Latin. Thank you very much. Um, and the point that was made, not necessarily the brightest kid in the class all the time. I get the impression, Goodsy, this woman wanted certain things and just worked exceptionally hard to get them. Yeah, and also there, Spence, and thanks everyone who's here and anyone who's watching um, today of this lecture. I think, you know, sometimes you got to you know, dig a little deeper about, you know, what drives a, a, an individual to want to do more. And she also was the baby of the ten, you know, so she's seen a lot of her siblings older do lots of different things, do it different ways. And I can just imagine that she was inspired, but sometimes, you know, wanted to be better than you know her siblings and she just wanted something that maybe some of the siblings never got to do um, or had the courage to do it and she was the one that wanted to do that and I think being that person in your family and sometimes it's a lightning rod sometimes it's just um, you know the courage you have because of your family or the lack of the things you didn't have that you go out and go no I want to be the person that's never done it before. Sport was a, an in for her socially as well she was a very talented hockey player and I got the impression at certain stages at school where in an era where you might have received some pushback if you were a little bit different with the colour of your skin, etc. Being quite a handy athlete seemed to help in some ways. Are you surprised by that, Bader? And I'll get your reflections as well, Adam. It seems to be a bit of a, an entree for her. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that. And we were just discussing before about how sport really is a way for um, particularly Indigenous Australians back in the day to, to um, prove themselves in a context that was not fair at all, that was you know, deeply racist, um, where there were heaps of barriers. And so sport was a real, you know, to use the kind of cliche, a, sort of a levelling of the playing field, right? And so um, for those um, people who were really gifted in that way, you know, it allowed, it allowed for them to kind of create opportunities for themselves. But, you know, what we've learned about um, uh, doc, uh, Uncle Auntie Margot was that, um, you know, not only was she trying to um, better herself, but also those around her you know, lifting up everybody else as well. You moved around a little bit as a kid yourself. Were you a, a pretty solid athlete right from the get-go? Grew up playing soccer, Spence, and then um, only really switched to AFL when we moved from South Australia to Victoria. Um, and there was no soccer team in the small community that we moved into. And we also were the only Indigenous family at the same school that we were at. So, um, you know, having my younger brothers made it a lot easier. And we were always outside playing um, with a ball, whether it was a basketball or soccer ball, and then turned into an AFL ball. But um, I have to admit, being able to run fast, jump high and catch balls, you know, that became the, the barrier lifter for me as we moved around. I went to six different primary schools and three different high schools. As we hopped around the state of South Australia, then Victoria, to, you know, get to meet mum's family um, that she didn't grow up with. So it definitely was a, a barrier lifter for us, but also um, from a confidence point of view, it just gave us confidence that, okay, we're equal, we're accepted. Um, and I've got no doubt, as I look back at those moments, that they definitely were the moments that helped me build the confidence that I needed to finish my year 12 at school, to stay invested in my studies, um, because I always had the sports um, to, to really rely on, um, not only for my confidence, but just the goodness from playing team sports that it gave me, being participating in a team, um, the energy that I got from it, and the satisfaction I got from participating in, in team sports. In 1957, she's the first person recorded as being an Aboriginal person enrolling in an Australian university anywhere. She's on an Indigenous scholarship in Queensland. Didn't really enjoy arts as a subject. I, can, I, mean, I did arts at university. My arts degree was the best nine and a half years of my life. I quite liked it, but it, di it didn't quite gel with her. So she transferred to the University of Melbourne and enrolled in phys ed. We've got the connection there with Dr Fritz as already explained, and in 1959 graduates as the first Indigenous graduate any course, any university uh, in Australia. So 1959, just going into 1960, we record our first Indigenous Australian passing through university. It's both amazing and in some ways, is it, is it a little bit sad? Are you surprised that it took till 1959? Not surprised? What's your take on that, Adam? No, not at all. We've got to remember that the 67 referendum hasn't even happened yet, yeah. right? So it really is about being a true trailblazer, um, not accepting, you know, what was put in front of her or what was put in front of her family, the restrictions that her family might have been on, you know, whether they had to, you know, leave the missions or how they were able to 
you know, break free from, you know, the, the, the laws of the state that were governing them um, during those period of time. And whether it was sports, education, that able to, you know, help uh, Margaret and her family, you know, it was an incredible lightning rod moment for all Indigenous Australians. You know, just like when Lionel Rose was out winning um, world titles around the world, you know, he was flying on aeroplanes to go to different countries, but he never even had a passport, you know. So, um, you know, that to me really showcased that, there was opportunities for our people, but they also had to be surrounded by non-Indigenous people willing to give them those opportunities. You know, just imagine being that principal that said, we've never had a black student do Latin or French, um, but they gave her the opportunity to do it. A lot of principals and people in those times would have just said, no, you know, you do this class, that's it. You know, there had to be good people out there that supported our ideas for that um, success to actually happen. You were, a, you were a man of firsts yourself within your family, weren't you? Tell us some of the, the trails you blazed. Yeah, well, it's all thanks to, to my mum. You know, my mum was born on the mission at Point Pierce. Um, and my family goes back 200 years on that mission in Point Pierce. Um, it actually is a very significant place for my Narunga ancestry at Point Pierce. Um, but, you know, I'm first person born outside of the mission uh, for the last since colonisation here in, a, in Australia. Um, so already I'm the first in that sense, but also the first to finish high school. Um, you know, my brother went, then went on to university first in our family to do that. So, um, you know, first to own my own home in our family when I was 21 after being playing football for a couple of years. So lots of firsts and I really think it's hard to, to be the first, but when you have a really strong parent, um, who you know puts a lot of discipline uh, and structure in your life um, because they knew how important education was. You know, every education was everything for my mum, and she made sure that we went to school every single day. Lunches packed, and education was the key for us to, you know, live a better life than what she did. Um, and you know, forever grateful for the sacrifices that she made for me and my brothers. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't easy by any means, you know. But you know, my life is a little bit easier than what my mum's life is and, you know, my children's life is going to be a lot easier than what my life is and I think that's a true sign of success and growth um, from, from where we came one generation ago to where we're going to be in, a, in another generation. Yeah, for a society to move forward, Baden, we really do need people to be brave enough or just seize the opportunity when they have the chance to be the first to say, yes, I will do this, I will step into this space. Yeah, absolutely, and I think it's important to remember as well, um, you know, you know what Adam was saying, but the, the kind of context of history, you know, 200 years of the mission before that, um, there were you know, no universities in this country, um, but there was, there still is, you know, like deep, sophisticated knowledge, um, and so thinking about, um, you know, going outside of the, the kinds of ways that we classify knowledge and classify kind of education as well is really important for, for context, I think, but, um, you know, it's just so inspiring and to, to hear, you know, Adam's story again and to to think about the, the connections um, between what we're hearing you say and what we've, you know, been he um, hearing um, Margaret Williams Weir's family so saying as well. Um, you know, really powerful stories um, that, you know, can inspire generations to come, I think. We'll talk soon about the t mm. special take you've taken on sport as a statement of culture and something beyond just the football fields. But I notice again with her, and I think, Adam, this overlaps with your work at the Go Foundation, it was her education that took her around the world, initially to the UK, Canada, later in life to Nepal, India, places like that. Still in 2023, if you can make a real change in the access that a young person has to education, it's probably the single biggest trajectory shaper in her life, isn't it? Tell us the people who might not know a little bit about Go Foundation and why that's at the, the core of your philosophy. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people might know about the Closing the Gap report and you know, we have 17 KPIs in that report and, um, you know, we're failing in about 13, or the government is failing um, in about 13. But one of the um, KPIs that's doing really well is education. You know, our students graduating from year 12, then going on to university, um, getting our children all into um, early childcare and preschool, those numbers are the, the highest they've ever been. So having that emphasis on education is really important. Um, and at the Go Foundation, which we created nearly 15 years ago, um, we really wanted to build something that was a legacy if Michael and I left Sydney to pay back to the local community that's been supporting us for so long. So 
where could we make the biggest impact? And it was just really clear. It wasn't about sports. Sports was a vehicle for Michael and I, but it was really education and education and that focus on it because 0 .00 something percent if of all Australians gets the opportunity to play professional sport at the elite level. But anyone has the opportunity to finish their education, possibly go on to university, start their own business. Um, and that to me was you know, really clear that that's where we wanted to focus. And what we started to learn in the early years of our um, scholarship program was that a lot of these kids were like me. They grew up knowing they were Aboriginal or they were just learning about it but actually had no connection to it. So a big part of our program is actually immersing them in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture and that connection to identity and how that has been able to give them the courage to do more, do better and raise the bar in their education. So the academic scholarships, um, we've got over uh, 1,600 scholarships that we've offered across um, South Australia, ACT and New South Wales. Um, we're just about to award another 270 in January next year. That'll take us up to close to 800 active scholars, so from primary school the way through to university. Um, Michael and I are both raised by our mothers and Michael's grandmother played a massive role, so did my auntie. So we've got a 60% focus on young girls in our communities and giving them more opportunities than the boys. Um, and like I said, that focus on education, it's all about their academic um, journey, um, their dreams and where they want to go. Uh, and more importantly, it's about immersing them in their culture. And we've just seen such great results. Um, we've got another Tomorrow night's actually our graduation ceremony. We've got another 70 kids graduating from year 12. Last year it was 30. The year before that it was 15. So um, and next year we should have about another 120 graduating from year 12, which is just um, exceptional. And, you know, if you look at just the averages um, for across Australia, you know, Indigenous Australians are graduating year 12 at about 66%. The kids part of our program are graduating at 78%. So we're a 12% kicker just because of our program and our connection to, con uh, to culture. Fantastic stuff. And, and let, let, let's take this moment now to go more broadly because in the same way Dr Margaret Williams Weir's life was more than a life just of sport, but sport in some ways facilitated her doing so many other things. Baden, your work looks at sport as something that is beyond just a contest that takes place inside some white lines on a Saturday afternoon at four o'clock or whatever the case may be. When did you start to look at sport as something more broadly than just two sides trying to score a winning amount? It was probably when um, Adam and I first met, really. Um, so we, to take it back a little bit, we first met um, when Adam was still playing and um, he was just started dating his now wife, Nat. And we were, my wife and I were living in um, Erskineville in a little share house with Nat. My wife goes way back with, with um, Adam's wife. Um, and so Adam would be crashing in our little crappy share house in Erskineville um, a few nights a week. And, so we started to go to the games. I, I did grow up playing a bit of sport, not as um, not at the same level as Adam. Uh, I played AFL a little bit. I think most people don't need to clarify. <laughs> I played sport, comma, not quite at the same level as Adam Goods, oh, comma, right. played a bit of cricket, same. not quite as good as Bradman, yes. comma, anyway. But here we are on a panel together, so I, I feel like I have to contextualise a little bit. Um, so, um, I, you know, I've always been interested as an artist in... Um, in the way things are and the way they appear to be and, the, and you know, how to kind of um, reveal things that are, that are not necessarily obvious but that are kind of implicit or lurking. Um, and so um, I came to, to art by looking at, um, you know, the history of technology. So I was quite interested in video games and looking at the relationship between military um, power and video games and tools that are meant for entertainment. And so sport, of course, uh, having exciting to go to a lot of games um, to watch Adam play, um, you know, I was always interested in sport, but seeing it through this lens, I guess, as a kind of hyper um, um, kind of spectacle, you know, it's, it's laid with technology, it's infused with technology and data. Um, the kind of, the links between, you know, the tracking of players and military strategy and things like that just got me quite interested. In, and of course, seeing a game live um, compared to watching it on TV, you know, you get to see the beautiful kind of, um, I guess, the relationality of bodies and the choreography of bodies Within a, within a space, uh, and of course the way that the audience reacts um, to those players and the way that, um, you know, the audience and the, and the kind of players, they feed off each other and the kind of space that's created between them, you know, um, emotionally, aesthetically, all those things. So that's how I kind of got into that. And then um, 
worked with um, Professor Aaron Kutz at UTS. Um, he was um, uh, generous enough to kind of let me hang out with him for a while and um, start to look at some data. So, yeah, sort of got into that okay. and um, we so went from there, really. So, so when Baden first starts to talk to you about sport through this prism of more than just a game where you're trying to kick the winning score, there is this concept of bodies in motion, it's almost balletic, or the technology and the role you play with that and does, does the guarded govern you or do you govern the data, et cetera. Did, did what he say made sense straight away or was your natural reaction as an athlete, what are you talking about? It's about kicking the ball between the sticks and beating the other team so you go through to the next round. <laughs> I could easily have said that actually, but I'd been, um, you know, I'd, for about five years before Baden and I actually meeting, um, I'd been tracked at my training session. So I've been wearing GPS units. Um, I was really clear on the... Because your, your career goes from when these things are quite fringe and experimental to when they're the absolute yeah. governing of, of every, every move you make. It went from wearing something like that on the back of my neck to, you know, something that was, like, really small like that that could, you know, capture that, that um, me running around the football field. And I was really clear... Um, after that five-year period about the data that was being collected and how I could utilise that for my own personal performance. But more in particular, I was using the data for my KPIs for best games, what I needed to do from a high-intensity running point of view, kilometre point of view, um, how many interval um, speeds that I needed to hit, so sprints at that certain level, so whether it was between 24 and 28 kilometres or higher, how many sprints I needed to do in each of those. Then we broke that down into quarters. I could get live data from my sports scientists who would come out to me at quarter time and said, you're down on your sprints, get your sprints up in the, in the second quarter, that'll help your performance. And I knew that that was it. Um, and I was really great at understanding the data set, I was really great at understanding um, the way they were feeding us the information. and. When Baden started talking about all this stuff, I was like, wow, like, we need to do something. I don't know what it is right now, but I would love to do something. Because um, I always have found a really great relationship with being able to express myself on a football field. How else could I do it? And mm. I wasn't sure about how else I could do that. Because by the end of your career, you're getting data on nutrition, on, I presume, on your sleep being monitored. I find these things fascinating. I'll, I'll occasionally wake up and, and just feel pretty good. I'm feeling pretty generous. I've slept well bouncing up and about, and I'm just about to walk off on the day, and my watch will buzz and go, warning, warning, you've had a terrible night's sleep, you feel terrible, you're in awful shape, be very careful. I go, God, I could have swallowed I thought I felt great, but my watch has just told me I feel absolutely... Like, you are, as a professional athlete, constantly monitored on dozens of different parameters and devices, aren't you? I am, and, and after, you know, a long career, you know, I played 18 seasons every year... The older I got, the harder it was to maintain the, the speed and the distance of, you know, the younger kids, you know, but I had experience on my side. But I also knew that I could keep learning. I could keep getting better. And it's about finding the areas where I could get better. So having a sleep mat on my bed, wearing my Apple Watch and, you know, sharing that data with my football club. Um, every little thing that I could try to improve I would work with my dietitian. I'd work with a spot, sports scientist. I'd work with my physio and doctor to find where I could get an advantage because it wasn't about the training. It wasn't about how I kicked the ball. I could do that all right. It was just about all these other little things where I could try and get a benefit and understanding how technology could help me do that. Who owns that data, Bader, and who should own it? Because it's, 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 it's a collection of stuff that's been generated by Adam, mm. but it's been orchestrated by the football club who want to use it, and they're the ones who are using it. How does it exist as a, as a thing? It's a complex question. Um, the law around it is very unclear because data is not an asset. Um, so the IP around it is, is murky. Um, there was a report done recently by the Australian Academy of Science. Uh, they had an expert panel of data in sport, and they looked at all kind of data collection in elite sport, and um, basically, um, you know, the report said that it's basically, it's still the kind of wild west. And um, teams are collecting because they can, uh, because they should, of course, there's, a, there's the kind of data is the new oil. Um, so collect it so that you can use it later. You can, you know, train your machine learning models. You can create predictive algorithms to kind of, um, you know, I don't know, change the odds or um, try and predict performance. But 
um, you know, in Adam's case, um, the AFL says that they own the data, um, and I'm sure they've got very good lawyers that tell them that that's all good. Um, so there's the other layer to that, of course, which is Adam's data having um, being recorded from his body, and for him as an Indigenous man, um, you know, that it's culturally significant. So there's a kind of Indigenous data sovereignty element to this as well, uh, which is, you know, quite a, you know, interesting and complex question as well. As, as a cultural philosophical thing, would, would an Indigenous person possibly look upon that data in a slightly different way to a non-Indigenous person in terms of Indigenous data sovereignty? If you had to ask me when I was playing Spence, I would say no, because I use it as a tool um, to measure performance, to um, educate myself about how I did perform and how I could get better, but also use it on how then I could train to improve during that week. Um, after working with Baden and the projects that we've done, I definitely do feel like this data is a very unique, um, um, a very unique data set of me in that moment that should that it, I feel very personal about. That it's me, in a way, being very naked um, for for the world to see, and I think. I should own that. I should be in control of that. It's interesting. Like if, if after each training session you'd written 500 words on how you thought and how you felt each morning and how you felt after each game and we collected all those as a collected works of Adam Goods, I think most people would agree, well, yeah, you, you've written that. If that's going to be yeah. released as a book or something, that, that's yours. It feels in some people's... It's, it's a little bit more an esoteric thing of, look, it's just a series of numbers and percentages and, and indications of how far you've run... In, for some people, that might feel a little bit different to your collective thoughts. Mm. But for other people, a Telstra heat map is mu as much something you've sure. created mm. as a poem someone's written. Mm. It is. And, you know, the way that I think it's really personal, because you see me, if I grab my data set from the years before, you know, um, I was booed for 18 months, you know, and then compare that to the data set of when I was booed, you know, it's two different data sets. It's, yeah, wow. It's two different times of my life when where it was happening and where it wasn't happening um, and that's unique to me it's about you know what's happened to me culturally you know if I grabbed all of my data sets of when I played an indigenous round you know there's complete spikes in all of those of you know that being a, a moment of pride for me being able to celebrate my culture in a very special way be it albeit just for one round um, so for me it is a it is a tracking of me and my life, but more importantly, me as an Aboriginal person in those moments, playing something that, um, you know, is, is very beautiful to me and very, and it came very natural to me as well. It's interesting. We'll get to we'll get to physical education within all this, but just still in the space of sport more generally about it, it being a cultural thing. We have an interesting relationship in Australia because we love sport in so many ways. It defines aspects of the country, or for individuals, it defines their peer group and what they get up to at the weekend. For some people, it's an almost religious experience watching their favourite team each week. They get ready days out and if your team wins or loses, like the... You know, I, I, I'm guilty of this with the Sydney Swans. A ball going between two sticks on the weekend once or hitting that post will completely determine a significant aspect of my mood for the next seven days. And if we get up in a, in a close one after the siren... I'm up and about till Wednesday or Thursday just floating. And if we don't... You just don't want to be around me on a Monday if we lose a close one. It's just... It's ridiculous how much impact it has. At the same time, we're a country where sometimes if people try and take a stand based on a sporting profile, if they try and express cultural belief, you get a little bit of stay in your lane, football boy. Don't go telling me how to... You're good at kicking a ball. Don't tell me how to do anything else. I find that an interesting conversation we have with sports sometimes in this country. Baden, what do you think? Yeah, it is. And, you know, Adam touched on it just before. You know, sport is this public spectacle. It's a public theatre and it's a, pl it's a place where, um, you know, crowds, the public, the general public, feel that they are um, allowed to express themselves in a way that they wouldn't usually be just walking down the street. So you can't just kind of, you know, scream at the top of your lungs just walking down the street if you're feeling frustrated um, because your team's, you know, playing badly or whatever. It is a really special kind of place. It is, it is a theatre, you know. It's a, it's a huge kind of amphitheatre. Um, and it is a, a national um, stage where, you know, the politics of this place play out, like, literally, uh, physically, um, and through, you know, specific people's bodies. So thinking about all that stuff that was happening and the data that was collected during that time, 
you know, that is a kind of archival trace of that moment, you know, that is of national significance. So these ideas that, you know, and still, if I do a project with you using that data, I own all the copyright by default because of the way that intellectual property works in this country and, and most countries. So tell me crazy, about the biometric right? player data, the, the collaborative tracker data project. I'm, I'm hearing that and the nerd in me thinks, yeah, I'd, I'd be down with that. What is the collaborative tracker data project? So it's a, it's a project that we did um, a couple of years ago now and uh, we showed it at Science Gallery, uh, University of Melbourne and uh, was commissioned by um, MOD, UniSA. And it was a kind of experiment, I guess, uh, which was all about, you know, revealing the cultural significance of Adam's data. Um, but, you know, also thinking about, like, what a repatriation or a rematriation would look like of that data. You know, it's, a da it's data that didn't come from a specific place. Um, it wasn't an artifact that was taken, stolen, and then, you know, put in a collection somewhere. Um, it's a very different thing. So we were kind of experimenting with different ways um, to kind of think about something which is, you know, quite intangible otherwise, um, but to kind of how do you, um, you know, return something that came from a body running around a field, um, you know, which is usually st stored on a USB stick or something like that. So, you know, art and technology, that's the way to do it, really. So, um, you know, Adam can talk about the, that project in other ways as well, I think, but um, really it's about um, taking the kind of spatiality that's inherent in um, Adam's amazing data set and using the kind of unique spatial grammars that, that art has, and particularly not just art um, as a kind of process of making, but art as it's exhibited, you know, spatially in a museum, um, just like sport is played, you know, spatially in a kind of field. Um, these two things have a kind of dialogue that work very well and allow for um, all sorts of, you know, amazing connections that were kind of there that weren't visible to be made apparent, I think. Tell us about the project, Goodsy. Um, so for me, um, you know, a big part of me reconnecting to my Aboriginality and especially my spirituality was actually going back on the country for the first time and I was able to do that through a TV show that I was filming called um, uh, Who Do You Think You Are? And um, it was just incredible to be taken back to this um, piece of land up in the Flinders Ranges where... Um, a lot of our people have been born and a lot of my ancestors birthing trees that I was taken around to and I just had this really strong connection to this incredible river red um, gum tree in the middle of this dried out riverbed and I was like whoa have a look at this thing and I was just talking to you know my my families my um, my namis and uh, umalis and my mothers and fathers and they were telling me about this tree and the significance of it and they were really surprised that I had a really strong connection to it straight away. Um, and, you know, the trunk was just ridiculous and how it survived in the middle of, you know, the water would be over 500 years old. Um, and then when we got back to uh, where we were staying, they showed me a picture, the first ever picture of my people um, that was taken um, the end of, you know, the 1700s, I think it was. And here is this beautiful widow in the back in the background so every time I go back on country I go back and sit underneath this tree just like the old people um, did and I just you know gaze out over the landscape and feel really grounded and connected from that so I thought you know if when we thought about doing something together if Aiden and I were like well, what would we do and I said mate we've got to go back on country I want to show you this tree um, you know we've got to do something with this tree and and for me that my connection to this tree to this place to my people and the culture, um, you know, we really wanted to showcase that and be able to do something that was able to share Aboriginal culture without telling you, but just showing you something that was really beautiful. Um, and and really, like every time I sit there and, and watch it, I just feel like I'm back on home on country, which is really amazing to to feel that. We had a couple of questions sent to us in advance. I'll throw them to you guys to get your thoughts on them. We're going to move into the space of HPE, bait, and this best might be for you, this first one. As an HPE teacher, I've seen declining levels of participation in sport, not only in school, but in community sport as well. What do you believe is the key driver to build the link between physical education, and sport, creativity, technology? Have you got any thoughts? It's a hard one, I think. I mean, there's a lot in there. There's so many reasons I think that sport might be declining um, in some areas. I, th I think some of the ways that technology can connect people with physical activities through some of the things that Adam and I are working on together, um, thinking about things in new ways, I guess, using, um, 
you know, new tools and new technologies, um, not as a kind of distractive thing, but a way to kind of like empower and create intrigue. Um, you know, thinking about some of the ways to, to look at sport, not just through a kind of entertainment lens or a, um, you know, getting fit lens, but thinking about all the things that it lets you do socially, thinking back to, you know, some of the um, comments we were making earlier um, around the kind of um, the social cohesion of teams and the way that teams kind of build confidence and um, connections and how those things are really, you know, fundamental kind of building blocks of successful lives. Technology so is a bit of a double-edged sword here, isn't it, Goodsy? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you, you've got three beautiful kids. You probably haven't yet seen your four-year-old go right down the TikTok rabbit hole. Trust me, it's coming. <laughs> the potential for devices these days in the hands of kids in the preteen going into teen years to just suck them away from a life of going out and kicking a footy with their mates and just running around because they've got nothing better to do until dinner time is profound and it's very easy to sound like the old guy who grew up without the internet but yep. we had nothing else to do mm. my mum and dad would just let us go in the afternoon and say if the sun is set by the time you're back you're in a bit of trouble yeah but yep. apart from that dinner's going to be on the table at like eight o'clock in a sydney summer yep. so make sure you're back for that i don't want to know i don't want to think about what mum and dad got up to while we were gone <laughs> but we were just gone for hours every afternoon yeah technology makes this a very different world for young kids now it does, and you're right, I'm, I'm not there yet. And, you know, my daughter, she's only allowed to watch TV on Friday, Saturday and Sundays. We call those family days when everyone's at home together. And um, I'm very lucky that, you know, I'm still playing sports, so they get to come and watch me still play sports. And I think the, the real reason, I think, why there's a massive decline from, you know, children participating is parents and the community. We are losing volunteers at our clubs to umpire, to... Um, support the coaches, the clubs to maintain the numbers that they need to get at the sporting clubs. And I've been part of many different programs over the last 10 years to increase participation. Um, and technology is playing an unfortunate negative um, part in this, but it can also play a positive part. Um, it really can, I think, by gamifying, um, you know, physical education can really get kids up and moving again, I think. Um, you know, right now technology, especially around social media, is, is used to, um, you know, really quieten the room with our kids in it. And as parents, you're like, oh, wow, some peace and quiet. But actually, it's actually doing more harm. I actually enjoy um, chaos. I enjoy noise and the kids running around having a good time. Because it reminds me of my upbringing, same as you, Spence. We weren't allowed to be inside. We had to be outside. Well, Dr. Dr. Margaret, one of ten. Correct. Imagine what well, that was like back in the day. Imagine trying to get a kick with, you know, nine older siblings running around. Like, it's just it's just tough, right? And that's what Ma and Grook was, right? Uh, Ma and Grook was, you know, two kin groups playing against each other, 50 on each side, and they'd play for days. And if you, if you weren't quick enough or you weren't smart enough to get in there and, and get it, you just wouldn't touch it, right? So you have to be able to adjust and be able to overcome the adversity, but also as parents, as, as facilitators, we've got to encourage the movement. We've got to show them that by moving, you actually do feel good. And by participating in teams um, and working together, we're actually setting them up to be really great team members in the workplace uh, for, for later in life. We do have the example of Martin Gook, and it's often spoken about across the AFL journey. There's a round dedicated to it and the like. A question here, what advice do we have for improving the way traditional Indigenous games are genuinely authentically embedded within health and physical education teaching practices. Can we get into cultural understanding, general capability and knowledge and understandings about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures? Is there potential there for learning through games and the history of games and things like that, Adam? Yeah, we didn't have workbooks. Um, you know, we didn't have, um, you know, documents that we could hand out to our young people and say learn this and you're going to be a good warrior or a good hunter or collector you know games were um, used as, as as means to teach children lessons and how to be good community members um, to have fun you know by playing these games you do have fun and more in particular you know games in in, in my Adnyamatna culture were always against the two king uh, kinship groups you know I'm, I'm a north wind man so I'm an Arudu man so the opposite of um, north wind is south wind which is the Mathuri um, and you, that's passed on through your mother's bloodline um, so any game competition it had always the teams were already picked it's Mathuri versus Arudu that's it and you were played to the death to beat them um, and that taught you 
lots of different things. Most importantly, how important your kinship group is and the people and the relationships you have with them um, because they are the most important relationship. So my father in my kinship group, um, biological father, is actually not the most important male figure in my kinship group. Oh, really? It is actually my mother's brother. Your mother's brother is is sort of more senior he's in it. More in senior than, than your own father. Actual, because he's he he takes on the other side of the kinship, being mothery. So just like my children right now, they get the bloodline from my from um, Natalie, um, their mother, which would be mothery, being Southwind. Because I married outside of my Aboriginal family, we had an Aboriginal wedding ceremony back on country, which gave her um, the kinship system of mothery of the South Side. She passes that on to our children. Um, so the most senior um, uh, person for a father figure point of view is not me. It's actually their grandfather because she doesn't have a brother, which is her father. Um, and it's actually not me who is the one that would be disciplining them and teaching them the life lesson. So those games, those systems are what teach us who we are, where we belong and the relationships that we need to have. So a few years from now, when you say to one of your kids, put your phone down, you're not allowed to use your phone after 6 o'clock on a Wednesday, and they say... Grandpa said it's okay. Are you going to let Grandpa come in over the top of you there making those rules around the house? I will be, but then I'll be having a word to Grandpa <laughs> afterwards. Uh, mate, if this is going to work, we need to get on the same <laughs> team here. These, these are fascinating concepts, aren't they, Bader? And there's so much of a role here for sport as a cultural vehicle and something creating conversations amongst groups in, in, the, in the process of learning game. Totally. And, you know, a lot of the work that um, Adam and I are doing together is all about... Um, you know, showcasing all the kind of com the complexity of Adam's culture that he just um, talked about through, um, you know, really exciting and innovative ways. So when we worked with Adam's data, we only used a small part of his data set, which was um, his mag magnometer reading, which, which measured his body uh, in 3D space relative to the magnetic north. And so Adam was just saying he's a north wind man, an auditory man. And so that part of his data set was, was particularly significant. Um, and so even just using a particular part of the data set, not like all 22 you know, categories of data in a really cool installation um, lets, you know, young kids understand kinship systems in ways that go beyond, um, you know, um, I guess just discipline, potentially, <laughs> a bit more fun. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's so many ways to kind of um, work with these ideas in and, you know, kind of translate them into, um, you know, forms and spaces that are really compelling. And I think that's the kind of power of you know, education, creativity, culture, all together. There's a fascinating story from Margaret, Dr. Margaret's life where she spent some time, as was touched on, in the Royal Canadian Navy. And she actually said in the 1960s, she found interacting with Canadians in the Navy was uh, more enjoyable and an experience that was free of some of the racism she still encountered in Australia. Um, and that's an unfortunate state of being, but that's not all that surprising when you think about 1960s Australia. You work with hundreds, thousands of kids going through, Indigenous kids going through high school these days in, in contemporary Australia. Is it different? Is it better? Is it just too much of a generalisation to try and summarise? Is it a kid for kid, horses for courses scenario? What's it like for an Indigenous high school kid in Australia in 2023-24? It's tough. It's really tough. Um, it's hard to find the support. Um, we have some schools that have... Um, 50 students in it, which is really great. They've got a real, they're supported really well. They have great leadership in the um, the school, and they have great community involvement. You know, with that amount of students and that amount of families participating. What we have seen, unfortunately, and it's been a byproduct of October 14 this year, um, is a lot of students, non-indigenous, have seen you know what happened with the referendum as a free ticket that we're not part of Australia anymore and a lot of racism has been thrown towards a lot of our students since that date um, because Australia said no um, and that's been really sad and hard to deal with a lot of our students and a lot of um, our younger students and how they deal with it um, but it's also you know we've spoken to them for many years about this you know I've shared my story around racism many many times with them so um, we try to protect them as much as possible but this is the world unfortunately we live in um, it's the world that our ancestors before us have lived in um, and they've, you know, unfortunately learned to grow with it um, and use that adversity to be better and stronger and that's the way we're educating our kids. Don't let that be the reason that you stop where you want to be. 
You know, if we just look on um, Auntie Margaret, what she's done, I'm sure she hit many hurdles and obstacles in her way to be successful. Um, and it doesn't surprise me that she went overseas um, and, and felt actually included and, um, you know, supported better than she was back at home. You know, many of my friends who are Indigenous, who have been travelling the world, working for uh, media organisations, they'd rather live overseas than here in Australia um, uh, because of, you know, the racism and because of how they feel when they're here as a black person versus living in some places, um, in Iraq, in China. They feel no, more supported and part of the communities there than in our own community here, which is pretty sad. And in a lot of those cases, you'd be talking about Indigenous Australians who are probably getting a bit of a better deal than your average Indigenous Australian, because at least these people are famous because they're on TV or played sport at a high level once or something like that. So if even people in, in, in those sectors of the Australian community are finding that a challenge, that's, that, that's a very disturbing message. It is, but there's a lot of success. And I think, you know, not focusing just on, you know, the trauma, the racism that's happening. It is happening, but there is so much good happening out there. And um, I really want to showcase, you know, like just a low bar when we talk about the Closing the Gap report, just a low bar of success is when we have Indigenous students getting a Cert 3 or 4. There is no gap when we talk about employment from an Indigenous point of view, a non-Indigenous. Oh, really? And there's no gap in the um, the money that they will earn from the job um, uh, that the non-Indigenous and Indigenous person would go from. So that's the low bar for me. Cert 3 or Cert 4, get these students to that level and we know they're going to be okay from an employment opportunity and from a pay point of view. Um, that's the low bar, you know. Um, the high bar for me is anything above that, whether that's university, whether that's starting their own business, whether it's becoming an academic, whatever it is, um, you know, we're there to support them, put role models around them um, so they do feel supported and connected to their culture. A long way to go, but even the fact that we're clearing that low bar has a lot to, to be owed to someone like Dr Margaret Williams-Weir and the trailblazing work that she did back in the 1950s, 60s and beyond. Went and knocked herself off a PhD in later life. And one of the accounts I read said... She'd seen someone else get a PhD when they were in their 70s and she thought, well, bugger it, I can do that too, and just went off and got herself a lazy PhD. A phenomenal woman who we're rightly acknowledging here this season. In closing it off, both of you, just a minute each, on the concept of bringing physical education into conversation with culture, creativity, technology, what, what does that topic mean to you? Of what we've discussed here tonight, what do you, what, what do you want the people here and watching to, to leave with? I'll start with you, Baden. Um, I think... Um, some of the elements we've talked touched on just around um, the connections between you know culture and sport like you know I think in this country they're often defined as quite separate but really you know the role of the body the role of um, you know action and um, and cognition in body cognition cognition particularly is quite fascinating to me I think and the way that um, you know I think the way that we define disciplines um, in the Western tradition is sometimes a little bit artificial and, um, in fact, the, the connections between them are a lot stronger than, um, you know, the distinction would have us believe, I think. So, um, technology and education, for me, um, kind of are ways to bridge those gaps and to create connections and, you know, just further knowledge and, um, you know, for the betterment of society. Adam? I think, for me, I, I take a bit of a different lens, you know, I can't physically go out into every community to talk about the benefits of physical education. Um, you know, I learnt from some of the best people of industry about sports science, about physio, about doctor, about um, health, all of these resources I had at my fingertips. I'm learning pretty quickly that those same resources aren't out there for every Australian. And what I've learnt since retirement now, I've been eight years, is that my mental health is a massive relative to my physical education. Uh, my physical education, but also my ability to be out there still um, running, training and being active. So we really need to bring back into the conversation the importance of moving and especially our young kids because if we can get them into team sports, playing sports, being active, you know, learning about being team members, if they can become active in team sports, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to be. I'm playing soccer at the moment. I have been for seven years, but I don't want to stop until I'm well past my 50. Because 
it keeps my mind tuned to being in a team. It keeps me physically active. It makes me get up in the morning and go for a run, knowing that I'm going to be playing um, soon. And, you know, for me, being a, a proud Aboriginal man, being able to express myself is important, not only physically, emotionally, but being able to now do that um, with Baden in, in different um, forms is another way for me to tell my story without putting it in the picture book, without standing in front of you and telling you, but actually as a visual for you to come and experience, you know, me as a data set, connecting back to my country um, and being able to tell you my stories of that relationship that I have, I think is we're very unique and I think we just got to keep finding ways to do that and finding ways to keep engaging the young people with that as well. Great stuff. Two men with some fascinating insights on the whole concept of physical education in the broadest possible sense. Please thank Adam Goods and Dr. Baden Palethorpe, <laughs> our guest for the Fitzgerald Memorial Lecture 2023, Associate Professor John Key, University of Melbourne. The lectern is all yours, sir. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Adam, Baden and Adam. We've all been amazingly privileged to sit here and witness this conversation. It's added so much to our understanding. It's, uh, you know, it's a unique opportunity for us here and for everyone online. Um, I just wanted to draw together uh, two threads, building on what you've already said, Baden and Adam, and introduced by Adam. The first is data sovereignty, which you've spoken about a bit, and questions about data. Uh, Baden, you spoke about the Wild West of data, and I think many teachers will be familiar with how much the, you know, the, the, the requirement of being a teacher these days requires us to collect data. And so that question of data sovereignty um, also applies to teachers. Uh, teachers and their own data, and the points you made about the data being uh, relevant to how you were feeling and experiences you were having in certain moments. And I'm just thinking, you know, how was the teacher feeling when this data was collected? How were the students feeling when the, this data was collected? So what is that data actually expressive of? So lots of questions there about data sovereignty, sort of building on that for teachers, physical education teachers obviously included. And the second one was Indigenous opportunity, um, where I think, you know, Indigenous voice, questions about Indigenous opportunity. And Adam, you mentioned, uh, you know, when we were talking about Margaret Willings Weir and the idea that there are good people out there. And I think we all need to remember that there are good people out there and we can be those good people. Um, and Fritz Duras was one of those good people, offering opportunities to Margaret Williams Weir. Uh, and I think if we can live by that example, uh, the example of both of them, all that Margaret achieved, all that Fritz enabled and all that he achieved, then I think we're on a winner. So thank you again, thank you very much. And can I hand over to Brad from Matchman, New South Wales. Thanks so much, Brad. And uh, thank you, John. And look, it's been a real privilege for Atchman, New South Wales to assist in hosting uh, this evening. And just on behalf of Atchman, New South Wales board and office, I'd just like to extend my thanks to our Atchman National Board and the Atchman uh, Victorian Board uh, and office who have helped bring tonight together and collaborated with the University of Melbourne. Uh, what, an, what an inspiring, thought-provoking, entertaining series tonight. So Adam, Baden and Adam, thank you so much. I uh, shared very openly uh, and honestly, uh, and I know everybody here that is present has been you know, totally engaged in this uh, lecture. Likewise, online, I know that we've got um, a few hundred online uh, with us tonight and many that will watch a little bit later. So just a huge thank you to all that have uh, attended tonight or who might watch later on another wonderful lecture series for 2023 and we'll hope you'll all join us.